Hey everybody, how's it going? Got the new backdrop going, 800 gallon, back in the hot seat where I used to live stream from all the time. Want to do a special shout out to Alice KH. That was our goal to get a shout out. It's there. So today we're going to talk about cloudy water. I'm going to check in, just make sure everything's working because we did move a bunch of equipment. And by we, I mean me. Moved a bunch of equipment, did a bunch of things, and I want to make sure this is working before I get into the technical talk of cloudy water. So, no one, no one's uh, rage quitting yet, so I'm going to guess that's going all right. So when it comes to cloudy water like this, so I got a couple things going on. One, there's always going to be a little bit of glare, and I will work on that continually for the live stream, but you can see things like whatever that is. That's a glare from this wall on the other side of the room. So that inherently makes this look a little bit cloudy. Um, but we took out all the fish. So we had archer fish in there. We had the uh, gold nugget pleco, the pinstripe panak. We had uh, datnoids. We had the ghost knife. We had uh, ladybird. All that stuff had to come out, right? And then I put these hungry hippos in there, the goldfish, and they've been munching away at the substrate. You can still see back here, they haven't gone deep yet. They're still on that top layer. And so what they've been doing is they've been just churning up everything and putting it into the water column. Now, I guess this is, let me show you my, my poop bucket. That's a nice sound. Ugh. Hashtag stole this bucket from Fritz at a show, but this is what I call kind of the, the poop bucket. You can see here, I've been using fine filter floss to uh, capture the fine particles. You can see down, down there, it gets way worse. That is brown water I almost poured onto myself. But this gets dumped outside, we wring it out, we you know throw them away, and that's how we have our sump set up here. Ugh. So, this tank's problem currently is particles in the water. Bits of food, bits of poop, bits of plant matter, because we used to have a big bulbitis in there, and this tank is far from finished, by the way. Um, but we need to get mechanical debris out of there. And what we do, well, I guess how we're going to do that is, in here, fine filter pads. In other aquariums, we could use sponge filters, we could use... Um, hang on backs, we can use almost anything that's going to have something to catch stuff. And so like this fine pad, its goal, so let me make sure people know what fine is. The finer something is, the harder it is for stuff to pass through it. Something really coarse, the easier it is to pass through it. And so this is meant to catch the finest particles. And you can see here like there's some bigger particles because I had just fed. That's actually uh, goldfish poop. You can, that goldfish just pooped right there. So you can see, real time, that's what's going on in there. And then you have all these tiny particles. The tiny particles are stuff that's been broken down over time, and that's what goldfish do. People ask a lot of times, like, what kind of cleaner fish can I get? Sometimes they even say, what kind of cleaner fish can I get for my goldfish? And the reality is goldfish are cleaner fish. They will continually break down their own waste. They'll poop it out, they'll eat it again, and each time they do that, they digest a little more and the particles get smaller, which for an aquarium is usually a good thing. Now, I debated on whether I was going to go uh, live or not today at all because I knew this tank was not ready. I was like, ah, oh. I did everything like yesterday pretty much. And I serviced the filters again today. And when I touched the filter, it wafted more back into the tank. I was like, ah, oh, geez. So I did a bunch of water changes and I've been kind of battling it to get that stuff out of the water but I said you know what let's go it's been a few weeks I've been super busy if I don't do it now then it's gonna be another week and then we're not gonna do anything so I said today's the day and so mechanical filtration this is gonna clear itself up in a few days mechanical would be the ways we've listed also mechanically would be water changing because we're you know physically taking the debris, debris out of the water that's the goal can we remove this from the water and the reality is yes, but some of the things you got to think about is we might be putting it into the water just as fast as we're taking it out. If we're feeding a bunch of messy fish food, 
If we do that every day and we've only got a system that's pulling out three quarters of what that is, we have a system that's always building up. And that's kind of what happened in here in my 800 gallon aquarium is that the mix of fish I had, while they didn't fight, there was no problems there, feeding them was actually quite difficult. And the archers only wanted to eat from the very top. Ladybird, the Mabu puffer, only wanted to eat clams. Uh, the threadfin acaras and the datnoids and the plecos wanted to eat from the bottom and eat sinking pellets. And so because I had to put all these different food types in, it led to extra debris in the water where if I could have just fed just one, would have made it a little easier. If I could have fed only frozen foods, that'd make it easier as well. The uh, archers, they just never did well on the frozen food because uh, they only wanted to eat from the top. So either A, grab a whole cube, or B, nothing. And so some were too small to grab the whole cube and it was a problem. So the food that goes in can be very important. Cleaner foods mean less maintenance typically. Frozen foods, live foods, those do well. Um, yeah, I would say that that's the mechanical portion of it. Now, if you didn't see some of these bigger like floating pieces in this tank, you might think from the video that this is a bacterial bloom. And that usually presents itself with kind of cloudy white water. And if you have a white bucket or something you can look down in and you can see, you'll see what color the water is. And that typically happens when um, we've disrupted bacteria. So, and this would have been a perfect example. I had to drain the water level down to here to catch the fish out. So all the bacteria that lived on these big panels of acrylic did die. So there might still be some bacterial bloom going in here. I'm just assuming 99% of it is mechanical or the, the particles, right? So we may have disrupted the bacteria quite a bit. We might, uh, we might put a big fish load in here. Like my fish load is low compared to what was in there. But if I had gone from this and put all the fish I took out and put those in, the bacteria might bloom to try and catch up. And so um, that presents itself in the white water. The remedy for that is kind of to do nothing. Basically, we killed a bunch of bacteria or we need bacteria. That's the goal is we need bacteria. And the only thing we can really do is let it settle on the surfaces and establish itself, and that will clear that water up. If we use something like a UV sterilizer or um, do a ton of water changes, that's going to get rid of that bacteria, but then the bacteria itself goes, hey, still don't have enough, bloom again, right? And so get in a cycle. It's very common. If I try and, if this was cloudy water from a bacterial bloom, if I tried to change water and get my way through it that way, all I'm doing is resetting every day and... You know, it's kind of a double whammy. Like here, I can just flow water in and it'll flow out. But you at home might have to like drain the water halfway. Meanwhile, all the bacteria up above died. Then you fill it back up again. So you took out bacteria out of the water column. You took it off the glass. And you get into this situation where it might just be a never-ending process. So a lot of times is just got to sit there and let it be the way it is. And it will clear up. So that's... You know, not a great answer because you might have a party this weekend. It's going to look great, blah, blah, blah. Like, well, then do your water change and know that you're just delaying everything that's going to go on there. Um, but that's my advice. My advice is wait that one out. Now, let's say you've got the finest filters in the world and that doesn't seem to be picking much up. By the way, like in this tank, one of these, that one from that was on the top, lasted two hours. So I'm definitely changing these out, you know, I'm changing out, I changed that one out more frequently trying to really polish this water for the live stream. Normally I'd let that go overnight and really let it get uh, clogged up. But, so let's say you've got all the fine filtration in the world and you took the water sample and you kind of put it in a white bucket and it looks green, not white, right? You're like, oh man, my water's cloudy, but it's green. Which, in an aquarium with good lighting, green water at the very low end of concentration or the beginning will look like cloudy white water. So that's why you gotta get into like a white bucket and you see the green tint. And when you see that green tint, we know it's a green water algae bloom. Now again, this can kind of get out of control. If we do nothing, typically it just gets worse and worse and worse until we get like pea soup green type of algae going on in there. And that's not good to look at. Very healthy for the fish typically because it's an consuming waste. Um, but we can't filter it out with a pad. 
and we've got a couple ways. We could try giant water changes. I myself find that I'm usually never successful with that. I've, I've tried it several times and it doesn't work for me. It doesn't mean it, there are other people that get it to work. I myself find that I can't water change myself or my way through it. Uh, so I end up relying on one of a couple methods. Two, the second one is you could completely black out the tank. So what that means is no light gets in there at all, even when you're feeding, all that kind of stuff, like no light, because green water can survive off very low levels of light. All right? So you could cover this tank with a blanket, you can turn off all the lights, you let that go for seven to 10 days, and most likely you would kill off a bunch of that green water. Now the steps I do when I would try that method would be do a large water change. So we're removing a lot of the green water and then fill it back up, cover it, no light, and then what's left, so let's say we had 50% of that green water left, it's gonna die and actually create ammonia. So when we get a week, 10 days, take this back off, we do another water change so that we get rid of any of that excess ammonia, plus we're gonna turn the lights back on. If we have ammonia in the water and we have light and any of those green water spores left, it's gonna bloom really hard again. Uh, so that's one way to go about getting rid of the green water. I myself, this day and age, just go straight to a UV sterilizer. It changes the cell structure of the, uh, the spore or the green water and makes it so it doesn't reproduce. That allows you to start water changing it out. Um, that's the way I go. And it doesn't take a very big UV sterilizer. It could be a pretty small one for a large aquarium or a large pond because uh, green water is fairly easy to kill, unlike ick or something like that where... Uh, it takes quite a bit of UV sterilization to actually pull that off. So, yeah, that's UV sterilizer is not a bad thing to have around anyway. You know, pair it with salt, like UV sterilizer and salt to treat ick, very, very good. Um, so there are definitely uses outside of just the green water. Um, and then there's, you know, there's weird things that could just be in your water, like coming from your source water and that kind of stuff. And that's a little hard to diagnose and you kind of go down a rabbit hole of, who knows what's in the water, but those are the main things that people run into. You could get cloudy water from, let's say, uh, tannins. So if your water's really brown, and because uh, you got a bunch of wood in there, that was one of the things, I took all the wood out. That was uh, definitely, uh, I'm not a huge fan of wood. So I kind of like the tannin look. I don't like all the wood pulp from wood-eating plecos that I typically like to keep, and no matter how much water I change in there, there would always be a tint of brown. And for what I want to do, and that is put it on video, take pictures, show it on a live stream, that little bit of brown wasn't good. It wasn't what I wanted to see. But if I'm, if just I am enjoying it, I don't mind brown water at all. It looks really good. It's, you know, it's, I'm not trying to get good lighting to film it. You know, to get a good clear picture of a fish, you got to have good lighting and not have the brown and all that. So. You know, I'm, I tend to lean towards rocks or fake wood decor in things that I need to work with. But if personal enjoyment, like I love outside my ponds, very tannin. I love it. Super good for the fish and overall does great. But if you needed to get rid of tannins, things you could do would be uh, use some chemical absorbers, things like carbon, you know, a carbon pad or activated carbon uh, in a little sock, something like that. You could use Purigen. Purigen will trap that up for you, and it's rechargeable, which is nice. Kind of a pain, but is rechargeable. And uh, those two are the main ways to get rid of it. Besides changing water, you can change a bunch of water. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I had a lot of wood in there, and I changed a ton of water, and I could never really get ahead of that. So, uh, you know, if it's a small tank, maybe makes sense for you. All right, well, if you've made it this far in the video, Maybe you're slightly interested in what we do. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. That's that's kind of the, the sales pitch there. Everything here is free. <clears throat> so, you know, you can do your part. Give it a like if you liked it. And if you want more of this kind of content showing up in your feed, hit that subscribe button. Uh, I'm going to take questions from the audience now and try and address some specific um, cloudiness things. Then we'll go to general Q&A and just talk about whatever. All right. So, we've got some super chats. I'll just grab that real quick. I have the dumbest question ever. That's always a good way to start. Dumbest question ever. I'm going through a cycle due to meds, okay? Obviously, there's fish in there. I have all things 
present in my tank, meaning ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. Uh, am I am I getting close to complete? So I personally, how do I put this? I don't cycle aquariums that way. I mean, even though chemically my aquariums do that, I, I, I basically have an order of operations that I follow when I'm taking care of aquarium water. And that is keep ammonia to 0 0.5 or less, keep nitrite to 0 0.5 or less, and keep nitrates to 40 parts per million or less, okay? So in a, in a case where we have all three of those present, it, it does show signs that your aquarium is not adequately processing stuff from ammonia all the way into nitrates, at least in a, at a rate that's gonna keep up with what your aquarium wants to do, right? So I would help it out with doing water changes. So a lot of people, what they think is, if I change water and all those numbers drop, my aquarium's not going to cycle. What we need to remember is we're building bacteria. So if you have five units of bacteria in your filter and you change water and you remove the ammonia and you remove the nitrite and you remove the nitrate, it doesn't remove the bacteria, it just removed those. Those are the parts that are hurting the fish, right? So then you feed again a couple days later, those parts go back up. You still have the five bacteria. The whole goal with cycling an aquarium is to find out how many of those bacteria do you need to support you feeding. If you needed eight, so now we have eight, but you only add five, you're always gonna be left with three parts of, you know, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, somewhere in there you're gonna be left with those, right? So all we're trying to do is buy time between generating more bacteria to handle that load and keeping the fish healthy while that process happens. So in a, you know, your question is, are you, com are you close to completing the cycle? We can't know because we don't know how fast you're building the ammonia. So you are in the process, right? So it would kind of be like if I, my business, if we need to hire people, right? <clears throat> and we're hiring a person a week. Okay, let's say we're doing that. Are we close to being done hiring? The answer, we can only know that. Well, how many people do we need to hire? Oh, 500. Oh, we've hired four. We're not anywhere close. So until we know really what the levels are, it's hard to know how close we are to being complete. But uh, we can do those water changes, we can alleviate that and buy us some time. The good news is if you just stop feeding your fish, that will lighten the load, need less bacteria. So if you needed eight bacteria, because you're feeding eight pellets a day, let's say, and you're continually doing a water change and you're having that three parts of waste left one of the ways you could address that if you were tired of doing water changes is only feed five pellets a day. So you change water, water levels are good. Now instead of feeding eight, we only feed five and let the aquarium kind of, okay, digest that really well for like a week. Then step it up, go, okay, we're gonna feed six pellets a day, right? And you might go test the water. Oh, I don't see any, any variance there. And if you step up slowly, that is a, uh, a great way to do it and you shouldn't really be detecting a lot of that. So it's one of the reasons why when I do use meds, we recommend not feeding and that kind of stuff because we don't want to build up ammonia if we compromise any of the bacterial colony that we have going. And in general, with meds, like when I feel sick, I don't eat nearly as much. Um, and just that's how animals work in general. You know, not that fish are animals, but, you know, things when sick don't act normal. So... Uh, yeah, that's how I would handle that and just slow and steady. A lot of these things, it's easy to feel overwhelmed or scared we're going to kill fish. The reality is though, if we know the process to get through something, it's usually just math problems of like, oh, I have three parts per million ammonia and I have a 50 gallon tank. If I change 25 gallons of water, I'm going to be left with 1.5 ppm of ammonia. Still too much, right? So then you might change half wait an hour or two, go change half again, you'll be at 0.75, wait an hour or two, go change half again. Now you're down low enough to be in a safe level and you can kind of let that ride for a while. So hopefully that'll help you get through that. I know uh, you had said earlier in the chat, which if you guys aren't showing up early to the chat, you might consider it because we talk and we talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, 
but newer to the hobby, and I get it that you can read 10 different articles. They're all telling you to do 10 different things, and sometimes as, when I was new, I would take the best from each article. I'll do all these things. Yeah, let's put in ammonia lockup. Let's do an extra water change. Let's put in a little bit of extra prime in there, and I'll cut food back. I'll do all these things, and you end up doing so much, you're actually causing more harm than good, and you could be wasting a lot of money. So, yeah, you gotta got to do a little bit of research. What causes pink tinted water? That I don't know if I've seen. I've seen pink allergies. I've seen, you know, it can turn pink with uh, potassium permanganate. Uh, if you use, it's in my cabinet here, but if you use uh, prosequantinol, which is a, a dewormer, that can give a little bit of yellow, sometimes a little bit of pink look to the water. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've ever just like walked in and one of my aquariums like, wow, it's got a pink hue to it. Uh, sometimes lighting can do that. Um, but I, yeah, I might, it's because I haven't run into it, I don't know the answer. And, you know, it, mu it must be fairly rare, at least in our part of the country, because typically at any, you know, for the past basically 10 years of my life, I've always managed at least 100 aquariums at any one point. And for me to have never run into it just is... It's bizarre when I run into something I've never seen before. Like, wow, that's that's crazy because you, you end up seeing so much after that amount of time. So, yeah, I, I don't know, unfortunately. If you take video and pictures, we can look at it through email and maybe we know something, but it still might just be a, yep, I have no idea. Sorry. So, all right, what else we got here? <clears throat> A super chat from Duke City Aquariums. I picked up some Java fern on wood, and a few weeks later, the fern is completely covered in hair algae. Any tips for that? Um, without knowing what other plants are going on, what your light is, in general, algaes are from an imbalance of light and nutrients. All right? If you guys have been around for a long time, you may see that a million times. One of the easiest things to control is our light. We either can use an app or we can use a light timer. Get that as a constant thing, maybe eight to 10 hours, but the goal is the same every every day. That one time you forgot to turn it off, that causes a lot of havoc in the algae world. Then it comes down to monitoring uh, water parameters. And really we want about 20 parts per million of nitrogen. Ideally that'd be with some other fertilizer in there so that it's a complete offering for that plant. And and goldfish to make a noise. Um, that, you know, so if you're using Easy Green, 20 parts per million from Easy Green and moderate light would create an environment where plants want to grow and not necessarily a place where algae would get out of control. But once you have algae, then it becomes a two part punch of make sure you've got those constants set, but then also something to kind of eat on it or manual removal with your hand. Uh, with a hair algae like that, you could use something like Siamese algae eaters, a mono shrimp, uh, Florida flagfish. I'm sure there's a few other uh, mollies, that kind of stuff. They'll start picking at it a little bit. A lot of live birds will pick at it. And you just need something to start helping you turn the tide. You Maybe you fix a lighting issue or something you have going on, and just time will also help. So, All right. Well, that seems timely. I will address other stuff, but this one just happened to be right up on the screen. Uh, Chance Baker says, a brief pitch on why we should be members. Well, first I want to address something that people may not know. Uh, a super chat that's under $4.99 won't show up on like the, the top of the screen. So it's harder for us people on this side of the screen uh, to see that. So that's why I'm getting it real quick because it, it shows up on a list. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a whole new crazy setup going here. Uh, but just know that at $5, it pops up there, and it's a little easier to see for us. Um, but the big sales pitch, and I don't, I don't want to call it a sales pitch. Um, why would you become a member? So membership is a program that YouTube rolled out that basically was a way for creators to make more money. Okay? So I, myself... I'm not using it for the purpose of making money. I use it for the purpose of sorting, okay? So what does that mean? That means you guys support me by buying from my website. That's super cool, love that. I would much rather have you guys spend five bucks and get this, and now you can use this, then, well, this might be less than five bucks, but you know, buy a product and use it, that's great. You know, if that's the way you wanna support me, great. 
But the sorting feature is what I, I've, I've kind of figured out is really nice. So what it allows me to do is get ready to sneeze on camera is what it's allowing me to do. But what it allows me to do is it allows me to separate the viewers from the fans. Now that might seem weird because probably a ton of you that are in the, in the chat right now are all fans, right? But the analytics, the back end of YouTube, what it shows is that 65% of people that ever watch the channel never subscribe, they never leave a comment, they never really interact, they just consume and go away, right? And, well, not necessarily, they will leave some comments, but when all this stuff is flooding in, you know, we get tons and tons of comments, I need a good way to sort through them. And if someone becomes a member, it you get a little icon. And what that icon does is that allows me to go, hey, that's someone that's kind of a super fan. They're willing to invest, you know, at least five bucks and... Uh, they get a little icon, and, hey, I'll make sure I try to give a little more attention or at least make sure I read that comment. I, mean, read, I read every comment, but I try extra hard on that. Um, if you're you know, buying stuff off the website, unfortunately, those two don't link together like YouTube and my website aren't buddy-buddy, so it can't like, hey, this person's you know, extra supporting you and all that. And so it's kind of just a filter is what it does. And so it allows me to see people that are super fans is what I call them personally. And then it allows me to uh, actually deliver content that would normally be terrible for YouTube. So as, a, as an example, last week uh, I was waiting, we had to move Lady Bird, right? So Lady Bird came out of here, she went into my living room tank, which was 230 gallons. I had to drain a ton of water because I had to catch about 100 silver tip tetras out of there. And so while we drained the water, it took like 40 minutes. I did a live stream from my couch. You saw like a white wall and it was just me talking to my phone in a lower resolution, not the greatest audio, but there was only like 30 people in the chat. So right now we have over a thousand people in the chat, but there was only 30. So if you really wanted to be like, oh, I want Corey to answer my questions, that was a perfect little moment. Yeah, the live stream was only like 38 minutes or whatever and it was rough and raw. Uh, but that allowed that setting, so, you know, oh, me and 30 people versus me and 1,000 people. Uh, also, we do have some other little behind-the-scenes stuff, and that would be, uh, like, I, I film some of my secret projects, and people have seen or heard about, like, the big change that was coming here. And really, if you never become a member, that's fine, too. You're going to see all the stuff. You just might not see it as soon, basically. I don't know. It's it's something I'm having fun with, and I guess that's why I'm doing the membership and it's keeping me active there uh, is because I'm enjoying it, giving a little sneak peek. Um, you know, I'm also playing around with stories as well. That's another free thing you guys can play with if you're not looking at the YouTube story that I do. Uh, that's another thing that that's absolutely free. But going full circle here, memberships do send a signal to YouTube. The more memberships we get, the better YouTube will help me. And so at this point, YouTube has identified that we are abnormal in that you guys seem to love what I'm doing and you will become members. And that typically only happens on like gaming channels and that kind of stuff. So being that we're outside of gamers and that we have loyal fans and people are enjoying it, they're studying us. And so the more thing, the more members that we get, the more they want to help us get better. So like we have one of the 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 beta, we're, we're a beta tester for this, right? We got in like a year ago, which was a really long time ago, right? And some of the first members will get their taco badge because they'll come up on one year. And, um, you know, so I, by the way, I think that's a, a little bit of a tip of the hat. If people are coming up on a year of being a member, they've seen some value over the course of a year, you know, to stay in because five bucks every month, right? Uh, but the more members we get, the more I can ask YouTube things like, hey, what's going on here? Or, hey, can I get this feature? So one of the features that we have that we get to test that not everyone gets to test uh, is that on your iPhone, which is what I have, if you're in America, you should have a join button. Now, if you're not in America or you don't have an iPhone, you don't care about that. That's a feature that's very narrow, right? But we get to help test that and give feedback and go, hey, is this working? That kind of stuff for everyone on YouTube. 
And then that becomes a thing, right? So that's kind of cool that we get to help, but then we're also on the inside or we know what's going on. And, uh, you know, what, what's the other thing I know? Is there something else that they've told me? So I've had the option to do the tiered system, or at least I've known about it for quite a long time. What that means is I could do a tier at $2. I could do a tier at $5, $20, $100, $500, whatever I want, right? And I could do different, like at the $50 level, you get into a super exclusive live stream. At the $100 level, you get my email, you know? And I don't want to turn it into a revenue source. Like, that's not my goal. My goal is just to sort people. And I feel like we can sort people just fine at $5. Like, $5, you're in, you know. And it usually, some other things will get you. Sometimes it gets you a special code to our website. Sometimes it'll, I'll let you guys know, hey, this sale's going to start in a couple of days. You guys can buy your stuff first if you'd like. You know, just these little subtle perks. Uh, I also use it a lot for testing. I figure... If I talk to people that I consider my super fans first and they receive it well, it's probably a good idea to do a whole video on it. But if they go, no, that's terrible. Why would you talk about that? Then I know, hey, I don't need to be doing this. You know, I don't need to waste a whole bunch of time on this stuff. So I use it as a feedback loop and it's just kind of a closer knit group. And, you know, without you guys experiencing, it's really hard to convey that. But the people that are members, when I do like a members only post on the community tab, which maybe I could take you guys into that. Let me see if I could take you guys into that, give you a little sneak peek here of what we're actually talking about. Because I've never done that before. And so maybe you could actually see what it is Corey's talking about. Let's see if, if this thing doesn't blow up while trying to do that. And if you're listening to the podcast or you're super bored right now, I apologize. This is something I've wanted to talk about for a little bit and we'll definitely get back to fish. It's just an important thing that this helps spread fish information long term. All right, let's see if this blows up in my face. All right, so you can see that we are live right now. And so this is the normal community tab that we are uh, playing with. And we're live. Yep. But down here, if we scroll down a little bit more. So like you see, I this is another thing we'll talk about later that uh, a new app is out for or an update is out for the Fluval app. It The Fluval lights now do more features, which is nice. It's not out for the iPhone yet, but it will be coming. Uh, so that's cool. But like people in the members only got to see that I had a meeting with Fluval. We talked about tariffs, the prices are going up, all that. Uh, you can see some things, you know, like, I mean, I guess the cat's out of the bag at this point, but we've been building a warehouse um, to move e-commerce to. And so people have been watching the build out for that go on. And uh, what else for members do we have here? Yeah, there was that members only live stream kind of five days ago. It was 40 minutes long. You know, wasn't wasn't a huge attendance or anything like that, but it's not about that. You can see some of what's new coming up in the fish room. Um, you know, you, you this might be the first time you've ever seen, like what is going on here? Whole new fish room. There's gonna be five videos. I think four videos we've already filmed about it. And, uh, yeah, and there's a whole 24 minute video I shot with my iPhone about the new warehouse and, you know, just, just that kind of stuff really. Um, yeah. And I, th I think I asked, you know, members what they wanted me to do more of and yeah, here's some more warehouse stuff, but it's mostly just what's going on in my life that, um, Maybe not the entire internet needs to know. Like maybe you don't need to know I've been working out every day to go to Peru and that kind of stuff. Like if you're just there to see like what the top 10 fish are for a 10 gallon aquarium, you don't care. If you only ever see me once, you don't care what I'm doing in my life. But if you've been following the channel for a while, maybe you do care about this or that or a heads up on this or that. So that would be not the elevator pitch because that was like a, uh, what's something that's really long, like an airplane ride pitch. That was my airplane ride pitch there. So, yeah. All right. So I'm going to get back to um, my goldfish are acting weird. Yes, my goldfish forever troll me. Two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, goldfish in the background would always um, – do derpy things and people would swear they would be dead and then I would go look at them and then they would be like, what are you doing? You're looking at me. So, yes. All right, well, enough about membership talk. I see now that a bunch of people became members. That is super cool. 
you know, obviously you're going to get access to all those benefits. There's other benefits like you get the custom emojis. You don't have to wait, uh, what is it, 60 seconds to type a message in chat. You know, there's, there's lots of perks that come with it. And I'm trying to keep it so that it is, you know, relatively affordable for everyone, but not just like, it's also not a place for, you know, because you spend $5 doesn't mean I'm going to spend hours and hours every day answering every question you can come up with. Like it's still, you know, I only have so much time, but it helps me do some sorting and I just, I check there first and then I hop on to normal comments and all that. Um, yeah, that's just, I guess that's the pitch. So, all right. We're talking about Levamisol in there. Yes. Love the live chats. Well, thank you, uh, Allison Dean. Yeah. Ooh, that is that is something that I, I do need to bring up is if you're if you're watching this at this point, hit the thumbs up button if you haven't already, if you're enjoying it. And then become a subscriber. Like that is, you know, the stats that we went over in YouTube, like everything else is up like 85 plus percent. Like my growth, they're like, wow, it's ridiculous. But you never ask anyone to subscribe, you're negative 25%. So even though the channel is like twice as big as it ever was, we get subscribers. 25% slower than we ever did because I don't ask for them. So I'm supposed to ask for them. Please subscribe to get more of this. So, all right, let me uh, grind through some of these super chats. I appreciate a bunch. Uh, by the way, if you become a premium member, you get, I saw this on an article somewhere, you get like $2 every month to give away to, as super chats, it's like a promo thing. I don't exactly know how to do it, but uh, sometimes that's where these one dollar super chats come from. So thank you. Uh, will bug bites work in an auto feeder? I would say yes. They're basically anything that's a uniform pellet works out pretty darn good in a auto feeder. So I'm gonna run a test. I've got an air conditioner right there that I turned off, and we are what 40 minutes into this thing, and now I'm starting to get warm. I'm gonna turn that on, but if it is really annoying let me know and I will turn it back off because I don't want to um, ruin the, the audio quality so give me one sec alrighty uh, let's see Jacob White said bought your filter pad with activated carbon is it intended to be kept in your filter for a long time or removed as the carbon is depleted kind of a twofold there uh if you leave it in a long time it's going to grow bacteria like a normal pad would but if you're using it for the chemical filtration yes when it's exhausted you would replace that so yeah it's one of that weird like after it's exhausted it does become a normal pad but if you need the chemical filtration you need to be replacing it so yeah, it's considered a consumable product. Like this is consumable, whereas the coarse sponge pad, not consumable. Like it's a reusable product, so. All right. We did the sales pitch, got a $10 super chat from Jody. So this is also my, my, uh, my plea, if you will. If your country allows it, like, Jody donated $10, which I'm super thankful for. If you subscribe to become a member for two months, you get a little bit more of a bonus, and it's all the same uh, in terms of money, but YouTube will be like, wow, this guy's got another member. Watch out for this guy, you know. So if you're gonna super chat money and you're not a member yet, try that. I mean, if you have a, suit like this one didn't even have a question, but if you have a super important question, you probably better super chat it, because I might miss it in the, the queue, but you know, we'll see what I can do here. Is water out of a water softener using potassium instead of salt safe? Wonder shells to put in calcium, anything else, CO2 planting. Let me, let me digest that. See, okay. Potassium instead of salt, is that safe? It's more safe for sure, but you can overdose on potassium. You can get a lot of allergy issues going, but yes, not as bad as normal salt. Uh, wonder shells for adding calcium back into the water. Yes, that would work just fine. And it's a CO2 tank. Yeah, I mean, you might consider uh, running a little bit of crushed coral in there too. Like that adds a little bit of the mineral content in there, especially with the CO2. Um, but it sounds like you kind of, you're asking the right questions there. 
which leads me to believe you're probably got it figured out in your mind like, oh, is this going to be a problem? And you'll, you'll sail right through going, oh, yeah, I got this. I think you're on to where you need to be. So, oh, I, look at that. The next, the next thing down the way was Jody becoming a member. Well, thank you. I, see, being on this side of the screen, it literally is like line by line, and uh, it's really easy to insert foot and mouth. Like, it's so hard. Cause, like, I, I kind of wish I could. Sh can I show you? Can, can we do camera, camera and camera and camera action? Let's see if we can do that. Like, this is. Let me do a photo here. All right, let me see if I... Maybe that'll work. This is what my... Oh, that's terrible. Let's see. Focus better. That's what my screen looks like. So I've got a scrolling chat up above. Then I put super chats down below. And that's scrolling. So I've got like two things scrolling. And then on this side, I have my own video. And then in front of me, I have stuff that I might want to show you guys. And so... It's really easy to skip a line or something and forget someone and someone feels neglected. So not my intention by any means. Uh, Johan, or Johan, I stopped using CO2 for my planted 60-gallon tank and plants are dying. Will all plants completely disappear? The tank is one and a half years old and you have good LED light. So there's usually a transition phase. So they're used to getting a lot of light, a lot of CO2, a lot of nutrients. If you take that away, they're going to struggle a bit. Now, if you have things that are really dependent on CO2, like um, Blixa japonica, maybe dwarf baby tear, um, aerial columns, I'm trying to think of some other things. Uh, if, if you have those plants, they're, they're going to die back pretty hard. But if you have kind of medium to highlight stem plants and that kind of stuff. Most of them will adapt. They're just going to look real raggedy for a while. And then they'll go, okay, this is the new normal here. I will adjust to this. So I, I would tell you, stay the course without knowing the plants. If you have all those plants I just listed that are super sensitive, don't stay the course. But if you have a lot of other type of plants, then just stay the course and make sure they're getting enough nutrients outside of the CO2. So... All right, can I use the med trio with guppy fry that I just bought? I heard mixed answers, and I'm very confused. So, Laura, this is one of those hard things for me to recommend. And the reason why is, so of fish, like let's say just normal guppies, adult guppies that come into my store. I've probably used the med trio on them a thousand times or more, right? But when it comes to fry of guppies, maybe I've only done it ten times. And I, I've never witnessed like, oh man, that went horrible. But with me only having 10 tests under my belt, I'm a little bit uneasy to say, don't even worry about it. It'll be fine. Meanwhile, you dose and it's a bloodbath and then you hate Corey forever. I don't want that. So what I usually would recommend is if you feel like if these were to die it wouldn't be the end of the world, then go ahead and hit them with the trio. If it would be the end of your world, don't do that. I've never had a problem with guppy fry or almost any fry that I can think of. I don't know that I've ever had a problem, but I haven't tested it on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fish that are fry size. I'm sure there's going to be an outlier there that I've not witnessed yet, and I don't want any of you to have to be that. I always, I always wish the the badness on me first, right? So, yeah, I, I feel pretty safe about that, though. All right. Ooh, my, my chat jumped. Uh, Reno Cutforth says, Love your vids, just can't afford the membership. I hear you, buddy. I, I definitely, like, you know, I should tell a story at some point uh, about working at a fish store and not making very much money and like for the longest time in my life i think from the age of 20 to about the age of 28 i would basically limit myself like i've got about ten dollars a day to spend on food and when you're limiting yourself that much on food there's not really a lot of money outside of that and that's just because i i, I was working jobs that i was passionate about like i had a, a failed 
uh, startup company where I was fixing computers, and it wasn't failed in that I couldn't do it. It was that I was horribly lazy and preferred gaming more than working. Uh, so that was a time where I wasn't making much money. When I was going through community college and working for the community college, making $7.35 an hour, wasn't a lot of money laying around after paying for books and tuition to eat. Um, and then, you know, owning the store for a few years, money was very tight also. You know, a lot of, a lot of days in the store of eating Top Ramen. So I, I totally feel you. And, you know, I do think about that. And that is why, specifically, I'm not trying to do what a lot of content creators and even can be pitched by, you know, YouTube and that kind of stuff is content gating. And that would be like one of the best ways to get people to sign up to become a member is go shoot some crazy great video and then only let members watch it. So then everyone would sign up. That's not my goal. My goal is to bring the absolute best stuff for free. And then if you want this other stuff, uh, that's in, it's extra and not vital to this, the hobby. Like I, like to think some of my content would be, uh, then you get that little extra. But I appreciate that kicking in the two bucks there means means a lot to me. I, I sincerely have been there and I know exactly what it's like. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Oh, check my goldfish. He's vertical. Yeah, he's... They're all weirded out. They went from... Some of them came, like that big one came from the 230 gallon. That one came from uh, the 125 gallon. And they went through a round of like chasing each other and wanting to breed this morning. And so, yeah. But in general, more goldfish are going in. Definitely I am keeping an eye because it's a new setup. And uh, yeah, that's, you know, as I, as I kind of tell people, it's my, my job to watch these things. I will do everything in my power to uh, make sure they thrive because... There's nothing worse than killing fish in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. Like, it's bad enough when you kill it and you feel horrible. But then when people say, hey, you killed that, that hundreds of thousands of times, even worse. So, trust me, if there was one person looking out for these goldfish, that'd be this guy. So, I will do what I can. And, uh, you know, they just ate a little bit earlier. So, that was always a good sign. When I watch them eat, like... You know, oh, you're all derpy. Oh, no. Food. And then all of a sudden, they're totally alert. Yeah. I love how my dog is, like, too lazy to go outside and go potty. But if you were to rattle that treat bag, all of a sudden, it's, you know, ready to run a race. So. All righty. 120-gallon tank. Good size for two Senegal Bitchers. I would say yes. Uh, should work out just fine. Wouldn't even worry about that. Like, they don't even get that big. So, sounds good to me. Uh, Jonathan says, didn't know I could donate once a month. Yeah, it's just a recurring little subscription thing. And uh, you get a few extra perks. Like, that's, I like that. So, yeah. I'm a, I'm a member of a few other channels. I don't know how many, but probably five or six. And, uh, yeah, I like the little bit behind the scenes stuff. A little more exclusive. All right, I am falling behind. I apologize. I'm going to grab some... Uh, I'm going to grab, all right, I have to disprove this. Like this, this is going to be the one-time example. Like he's been vertical for a minute. I'm going to walk over there and then he's going to be like, what are you doing? You know, and that's, that's what goldfish do. Like, see now he already knows I'm talking about him. Like he already knows like, oh, dad's coming over. Hold on. I better do a thing. Like goldfish, they live to troll me on live streams. Like it's an ongoing gag for like the past three years. It's half the reason I got rid of goldfish as my backdrop is it always devolved into, hey, the goldfish is doing a goldfish thing. Check on that goldfish. Hey, that goldfish. Hey, that goldfish. Right now. Like, look at him. Now he's doing laughs. He's like, ha, I got dad in trouble. <laughs> Job here is done. All right. Uh, thanks for the amazing content. I'm breeding deep blue Moscow guppies and red cherry shrimp for profit. Thanks to you. Ideas on a plant for profit. 100% just, justice pain. Java Moss. I so badly want any of you in the chat to become the number one Java Moss producer in the world and sell it all to me. I will buy it all. I've had so many people go, oh yeah, I doubt. I make a lot of Java Moss. And I literally like, I will buy it all. And I've yet to ever have anyone come through. Like, so people will talk some big game and I'm like, great, let's take $5,000 worth of Java Moss. They're like, well, well, I, I, you know, I gotta have some ramp up time and, you know, I gotta do some things. Like, 
I need Java Moss more than I need oxygen. Like we are so oversold on Java Moss. There's 4 billion people waiting right now to be notified the minute we can get Java Moss. So that is the one I highly recommend that you get going in your tanks. And I plan to get some going as well. Ooh, Fish Tank Barns do donating to the ice cream fund. Awesome. Typically, this is a kind of a, a known thing. We'll go out to dinner or ice cream after like aquatic experience or um, or Aquashella, and it's a little customary for me to be like, ah, oh, ice cream's on me because it's not too expensive, and I like to give back, and I just like to. I'm not a drinker, so there's there's like group A, they're like, we're going to drink, and then there's like group B, is like, we're going for ice cream or something, and we just hang out and talk. So, I appreciate that. All right, floating carpet and a, okay, so floating slash carpet and a mid that do well, beginner low light. Oof, the low light is putting the kink in there. Uh, for a floating like matte carpet thing, I would say Rikia, you know, even low light when it's close to the top, it gets a lot of light. So try Rikia, you can use that attached to a rock and sink it, but eventually if you don't trim it a lot, it'll rot out on you. Uh, but it is a floating carp kind of carpet plant. Uh, for a low bottom carpeting plant, Marsilia minuta, hard to find, but is a low light plant. Uh, and then mid ground plants, buy all the cryptocorns you can get a hold of. Crypts are amazing. Yes. All right. Um, someone, yeah, Alice saying, I promise you, you can see wedding pictures. I'm sure at some point you could. I don't remember. I don't remember promising that. I remember promising like like me having like piercings and stuff, but I don't remember that, which I'm not opposed to that. Like there's wedding pictures, but they're probably on our Facebook and stuff. All right. Uh, Rocklin, thank you for the suggestion of Ryo on Tabi's channel. Yes, Ryo is a great uh, fish YouTuber. I really enjoy him because he spends his time going between Singapore and Japan. And there's so much cool stuff to see in both those countries that, I mean, I, I watch the fish, but I'm really watching for the crazy stuff outside the fish tanks. Just the way he lives his life is kind of cool. He was a tennis instructor for a while. He looks like he's 12 and he's like, I think he's like 21 now or something. But the crazy is when you go look at his videos, if he puts like a hat on backwards, he'll look like he's 12. And then if he doesn't wear a hat, he looks like he's 20. Like he's got those crazy jeans that like, I swear, morph when he puts a hat on. The fish life, I haven't seen this kid, and I say kid because I think he was like 12 last time I saw him, in a long time. But he says, great, great live stream, just really be recently became a member, hope you and Jimmy are doing well. I got to go shoot a video. Yes, he's got his own channel, he does some very cool, and this is actually cool stuff, like not, like it's a kid go support him type cool, like wow, you're actually doing cool stuff. And he knows a bunch of different languages, like this kid actually does these experiments that I'm genuinely interested in, not just go support this person because they're a kid type recommendation, but you're actually doing cool stuff that I am engaged with. So, you know, don't let the fact that he is younger dissuade you from checking out the content. The content is actually very good. I watch it out of genuine interest. And I'm a guy that doesn't watch a lot of YouTube, so that says quite a bit, but he's willing to not let the internet tell him something. He goes and experiments and builds stuff and does stuff, and I find that fascinating in the aquarium hobby, so. All right, I'm sure I have missed a bunch of new members. I apologize, not meaning to do that. Uh, and I may have missed some Super Chats. I'm going back through. If I miss it, I apologize. I'm not trying to, that is not my intention, so. Uh, oh, Rachel's, Rachel's adding in the parameters, low light, and for hard water, what's next? And your aquarium's on fire and has to taste like candy? Um, <clears throat> in general, if the water is crazy, 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 crazy hard, there's nothing I can do about that. But if it's not absolutely Captain Insano, then all those plants I listed will still do well. Uh, the reality is a lot of the plants are grown in pretty hard water out of Florida, so they adapt pretty good. Um, yeah, without really knowing your specs, it's hard to give a better recommendation, but when you start limiting too many variables, you end up with this pile like, yeah, you, you can you can grow these. You know what that is? Nothing. That's zero, right? So 
Uh, yeah, but I think you still have options. I think those will still work unless you're just so far on the spectrum there. So. All right. Yeah, this Critum, someone's saying, can't wait to see it get bigger. This Critum took a beating. And the beating is from uh, the temperature. I had it up at 85. So part of the thing I was running into is when I was traveling a bunch, when I was in Israel, Ladybird got ick. We turned up the temperature. We were using meds. We were doing things. And, and like, this plant took a beating as well as the bulbitis. And so now we're going to run a much cooler water. It's goldfish. And in general, plants appreciate cooler water. So even though it's got some algae on it and, like, that leaf's a little bit yellow, the roots, which this came out of Murphy's tank, by the way, the root system should be getting, starting to get uh, established now, and it should start really just becoming this monster of a plant. So I, I love crinums because they don't grow too crazy fast, which means I don't have to do a crazy amount of work. I like that. Max colony size and a new Cardinia 10-gallon. People push it towards 300. I think a, a healthy number is more like 100. At 100, that's a lot. Like, that's you're still doing plenty. So, do I think a Phoenix Stingray is strong enough light for a 150-gallon tank, 20 inches deep, for plants like Anubias, Java Fern, and Jungle Val? 20 inches deep, that's very similar to a 20-gallon high I think you could do quite a bit. The only one I'm a little, like, maybe the jungle vowel might be a slow grower. But otherwise, yeah, I think you could do all right. All right, I want to hop into a lot of these uh, a lot of these questions here that aren't super chats. Because I always, I always internally struggle. I feel super guilty when I'm only answering super chats and that kind of stuff. Like, my goal, my honest goal is to sit down and help as many people as I can in two hours. That's my goal every time. So... You know, however I get there, uh, you know, changes from time to time, I would say. I miss Jimmy for sure. Yes, it was very sad to, you know, kind of hug Jimmy and say, have a good time in Ohio. We'll see you again. We'll see you at Aqua Shell, all that. Like, you know, he lived with me for years, two years, and, you know, quite a good bond going there. So, but, you know. It, I will say it's great to have our house back. We can, you know, I, I can be out here. I don't have to worry about someone walking back and forth. Like, there's perks and there's minuses. Uh, it definitely has changed the way we work on videos. Like, maybe for the better, um, just because I have to be more direct. Like, hey, I'm thinking at this part I want to do this thing instead of, like, he, you know, can call me over and look at something. Uh, but, you know, so far I think we're both really just enjoying it, and we'll see how it goes. So, but, yes, definitely, you know, the dogs miss miss jimmy and that kind of stuff so yeah opinion on a dry start method for monte carlo so that's a carpeting plant um i myself am not a fan of dry start method only because you get most people get a lot of melting back when they flood it right so the ways to transition from you carpet it out right with dry start so let me let me qualify what dry start is for people who don't know. You'd have your substrate in, you plant all the plants, you put some mist in there, and you put like saran wrap over the top, and you let the plants grow kind of as seedlings, or you know, they're basically incubating. And they're gonna spread a lot faster, right? Then eventually you wanna put water in it because you want fish in there. Well, when you flood it, they went from getting unlimited CO2 out of the air to now they gotta get CO2 out of the water. Water has a lot less CO2. So to make that transition, really we need to inject a lot of CO2 to really do well. Well, if we're already going to inject that CO2 to get through the transition, I find it easier to just plant them in water with CO2 and just let them do their thing. So here's what I know. I know if you know what you're doing, it can save you some time, right? So instead of carpeting out, taking six weeks, you dry start method, you can do it in three or four. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can just kill a bunch of stuff in three or four weeks and then replant it and delay yourself by three or four weeks. So... You know, I personally just go straight for, ah, just plant it the way it is. I got time. Time's on my side. I, you know, in, in six weeks, I'll still be live and I'll enjoy that carpet. All right. I missed this one. Hey, Corey, I've got, I just got a two-inch albino Oscar with a 75-gallon tank. Am I all right with two large sponge filters or do I need a flu ball canister filter? All right. Well... I personally believe you can get away with the two sponge filters for quite a while. Sometimes Oscars will start chewing on them, though. That can become a problem. 
The 75 gallon is the size in which I start thinking about canister filters. If you think you will enjoy servicing a canister filter, yes, get one. If you were gonna get one, I personally love the FX4, Fluval FX4. That's the one I use on my 230 gallon tank. I like it because it's not as powerful of a flow, which means that I can keep it you know, low flow if I have goldfish or something like that, and I can use other things and not have too much flow going. So I'm an FX4 guy. It's a little bit cheaper than the FX6 as well, and I like it, but truth be told, I use a lot of sponge filters because I like to clean them. I enjoy cleaning them. Something about getting the gunk out of that sponge and having the oxygen there and just being inside my tank. I enjoy that aspect where getting down under a stand and pulling that thing out and hulking it to the sink, I don't enjoy that part. So, you know, it, it tends to be that I will neglect a cancer filter and I won't neglect sponge filters. So I lean towards the thing I don't neglect. New members all day long. Thank you very much. All right, let's get back into the chat roulette. Uh, ooh, this one says, please help. Can I have a tank with a pea puffer, cockatoo, and tetras in a 25 gallon cube? The pea puffer, okay, so anything has a chance to work. Now we're going towards odds. Odds are that pea puffer might get a little bitey on some of the fish. Now, the cockatoo cichlid, or the epistogramma cockatoides, with tetras, that's peanut butter and jelly, going to work great. That pea puffers, that, you know, that monkey wrench in there, like, well... So, you could, you could try it, right? Knowing that, like, this isn't working, pea puffers going back to the store, or you could just go, hey, I'm going to make this community tank, leave the pea puffer out, and have an easier time. That's the way I go with, personally. All right. Uh, what's a good low light starting plant that I can put in the substrate? Uh, asks Evan. I my favorite, like, if you ask me tomorrow, you can have any plant you want all over the bottom of this thing. I would choose a crypt. It would either be Crypt Lutea, Crypt Lucens, or Crypt Wind that I read. One of those three. I use them all the time. They always look super good. They're low maintenance and they're robust. So that's what I would do. Like, they're. And they happen to be low light. Like even, even in high light, doesn't matter what scenario, I still want those plants. If I'm injecting CO2 and I got all the light in the world, I'm still incorporating cryptocorns into my tanks because they're awesome. Like low light or high light, doesn't matter. And they just happen to do really, really, really well in low light also, which is an added bonus. So, yeah. Uh, August says, I have my first sickness in my tank. Looks like dropsy, but they have stringy white poop. Uh, I've used General Cure, but it's not working. Any of you have any ideas on what I can do? Um, so if General Cure is not getting it, let's assume that you've done like a course or two of General Cure and it hasn't helped you. Uh, you might try moving to something like Levamisol, a, a different type of dewormer, or Fenbendazole, another type of dewormer. Uh, if it is dropsy, it could be organ failure. So the white poop or the clear stringy poop could be that it has diarrhea because kidneys are failing and that kind of stuff. So it's without pictures, it's a little bit hard to diagnose, you know, where are we going wrong here? In general, good, clean, healthy water, stress-free environment, healthy food, and deworming, that's covering like all those basics. If all of that's not doing it, it could be dropsy or liver kidney failure, something like that, that there's going to be no cure for, unfortunately. There's just like, that's, we're at odds, that's going to happen. And that's something we tend to forget about as hobbyists, I think, is that, um, you know, out of 100 fish, one's going to get cancer, one's going to have tumors, one's going to have liver failure, one's going to get eaten by another fish, another one's going to stab its own eye out with a stick because it didn't know what it was doing. Like, there's all these things that are just going to happen. It's not always something we've done. We just assume it has, because that is what happens most times. Like, oh, I was being dumb, blah, blah, blah. I got my fish sick. Now I have to fix it. But there is like that 10 or 15% of like, no matter what you did, that fish was going to come down with that illness or that disease. And some diseases don't have any cures. So that, it sucks. But, you know, you also don't want to get so complacent like, yeah, 
you know, I've had 100 sick fish in my life. Every one of them was cancer, I'm sure of it. Like, we don't want to dismiss the fact that we could be doing wrong things, but also realize that if it's limited and isolated, it could be that. So, lots of new members. Thank you guys so much. All right. Do -do -do. What can you put with tiger barbs? Banana Guy has been asking me this in the comment section for a while uh, today, and I hadn't had time to answer. I hadn't had time to think about it. So I'm going to do it. I like to do things live because then I know you guys know it's true knowledge coming from my Brian and not just me Googling it. So if I was doing a Tiger Barb tank and he had said besides like a clown loaf tank like we used to do back here. So the things I know about Tiger Barbs, I'm going to want fast moving fish. I'm going to want things that aren't tiny that fit in their mouth. I'm not going to want super long fin stuff. Uh, so innately, I think Danios are a good choice. I think rainbow fish are a good choice. I think other types of barbs, like Odessa barbs, would be a great pairing. I think you could do Corydoras across the bottom. I think you could do probably uh, like Petricola catfish across the bottom. Uh, what else do I think you could get away with? I wouldn't do like neon tetras and stuff. I think they're a little too slow, but you could do things like Congo tetras, Colombian blue tetras, any of those bigger body tetras. Maybe not the skirt tetra. They're a little bit slow. Um, what else would I be playing with? I could see platies, um, not sword tails, but platies I could see working out pretty good. Florida flagfish, um, uh, things like juraparis or other big earth eating cichlids or stuff that won't be aggressive towards them, but also won't be bullied by them as much either. Uh, there should be quite a few options. Tiger barbs get a really bad rap, mostly because we put too few of them into a smaller aquarium instead of a large group of them into a larger aquarium as part of a bigger overall design. So, do I have any videos on vertical tanks? I tried searching, but I didn't see uh, anyone outright. So, Pam, I'm wondering if you're talking about like more of a column style tank, or are you talking about like when you take a pond and then you put a tank in it so the water can come up out of the, the like the top of the pond? I really don't have a good video on either of them, uh, other than uh, I'm intrigued by column tanks. I always think they're kind of a cool thing. Normally I build a center type of column out of rock or a big plant and make the fish go around it because I always think it looks cool, but uh, I haven't done that in a long time because mostly I want easy to maintain setups and column tanks tend to be very deep and that's not easy to maintain, especially when you're doing a lot of tanks. So. All right, if you made it this far in the video and you haven't liked it yet, hit that like button. Now you're, you're over an hour, buddy. Over an hour. Hit that like button, please. It, so I, I got confirmation from Google. It legit makes a difference. They're like, yeah, someone hitting the like button actually matters. And I was like, all right, say no more. I will uh, encourage people to like my stuff if they like my stuff. So makes sense, right? You like it, you like it. Does Epsom salt help with dropsy? It can. Uh, so when a fish has a lot of fluid in it and we're trying to let that fluid out, um, yes, Epsom salt can relax some of the muscles and make that come out. But I, out of all the things I do to cure fish, that is like very low. Like maybe once every couple years I actually use Epsom salt. So I would say... I usually cure things with cleaner water, meds, that kind of stuff. But, And it's not to say that it doesn't work. I also, when you don't utilize something all the time, you're not as confident with it, right? So it could be that I need to do a lot more learning with Epsom salt to really understand more of the benefits from it. So, yeah. Thanks for the super chat, Russell. $1.99. I appreciate it. Uh, oh, Pam followed up with a, like a hex or a column. The lighting and the swimming space is just so different. Yes, it is. It's a fun challenge. I actually have a 20-gallon hex in the garage I bought brand new off of Amazon. And it's in the. It's still the tank I want to do a sweet potato growing out of and that kind of stuff. Like I still have an earmark for that project. I just haven't had time building the warehouse and all that. Um, but typically what you end up doing for lighting is you stack a bunch of lights. So like on that, I plan to do two or three Stingray like 12-inch lights 
to get enough light to go down to do what I wanted it to do. It is a challenge, but when you have a bunch of aquariums and you've been doing it for a long time, the challenge is almost the fun part. Like, oh, that will be, that'll be fun. I'll do a lot of brain thinking on that one. I enjoy the thinking about how I'm going to do something almost more than actually doing it when it comes to an aquarium. So, yeah. Stocking ideas for a 55-gallon community tank, preferably. Something interesting to look at, asks Robert H. So, interesting to look at is always subjectable to the person looking at it. It's like art, right? Um, a lot of people get a lot of mileage out of lots of community fish like tetras, smaller rainbow fish, uh, platies, um, danios, rasboras. You can kind of mix that kaleidoscope of color together. Uh, if to me, like something is kind of interesting is when I start mixing like Lake Tanganyikan species with community fish. So maybe you've got a shell dweller or lalupi down low, but then you have neon uh, praycox rainbows in the center, right? And then you've got some danios up top, like that kind of stuff adds another layer of like, hmm, would these fish get along? I think they would. Would their diets be right? Like, okay, they could all eat the same blood worms and that kind of stuff. Okay. What about water primers? Okay, hard water fish, hard water fish. Tolerates hard water? Okay. What about, you know, and so like I, I work those angles, I go, that would be cool. I haven't seen that before. I'll be the guinea pig. I'll try that. So that's what I find interesting. And there's, there's so many. That's why I haven't done the 55-gallon tank idea video yet is there's almost so many things that I haven't started writing them down yet. I need to, That's what I do typically is I write down a bunch of ideas like for a 55-gallon tank or a 29 or whatever I'm doing. And I start sorting of like what's the best few for this video. And then I keep working on it because – I don't just want to take like, you know, a real easy way to turn out content would be like list all the top dwellers I can think of, list all the mid dwellers, list all the bottom dwellers, and then just be like take one from group A, one from group B, one from group C, talk about that, and then take two different plants, boom, there you go, that's a setup, and I can just like rinse and repeat that all day long. I want to be things that I would actually like or that I've actually done before that looked really cool. Like one of the 55s I really loved – uh, way back in the day, before I owned a store and I worked at a store, was I had clown killie fish, I had Norman lamp eye killies, and I had albino bristle nose in a 55 gallon tank, and they were all breeding and all making babies, and I really enjoyed that tank. Not a common setup, but because it was all the killies that only get about that big, and they look super cool, and they all have the bright blue eye that looks at you have from across the room. And I didn't have to do any work to raise the bristle nose babies, raise themselves. And same with those guys. It was kind of just feed, will make more, super enjoyable type tank. I enjoyed it. So, all right. Jonathan says, hey, spoke before about my faka puffer in Australia. So I think if you haven't, aren't privy to this, he's like one of the few people that got a faka puffer in Australia. And I think he was having some problems at that point or was wondering about a tank size. But I'm going to delve into this here. Uh, it's doing great and on pellets with prawns, fish, and snails. Good. Uh, puffers forever. Doing uni post-grad study on hornwort ecology and nutrient uptake. Yeah, that's a crazy thing. When you look at uh, some of the studies, there's some studies out there that show nutrient uptake. And it's been a few years since I've read it, but like, and this is like of all plants. It was like number one was like, the Douglas fir tree, and then it was like the corn plant, then it was like water hyacinth, and then it was like hornwort. It was crazy high up there for actually cleaning water, uh, and that's why sewage waste plants here in America will use hornwort and water hyacinth to help remove toxins from the water. They're very, very efficient at it, and so, yeah, we're lucky that we, like, you can't put a Douglas fir in your, tr in your aquarium and that kind of stuff, so we're lucky that like two plants like that are highly usable by us. All right. Russell's got a question about, he's about to upgrade to a 48 inch long tank, 20 inches front to back, 20 inches high from water box planted aquarium. Would a flu ball 3.0 light be fine? Let me, let me think here. 20 inches. Um, uh, so as long as you're doing medium to medium high light plants, yes, one Fluval 48 inch light would be appropriate. Uh, if you're gonna really do high light and put CO2 in there, I would go with two. 
like a fluval light lights up about 18 inches really well. You've got about 20, a little bit. So you might see a little bit of darkness in the corners. Um, but it's really easy to put like bigger, taller plants or things that don't need as much uh, light in those corners, which brings up a good point. So Fluval, uh, we had a, I had a meeting with them. They flew in uh, to talk with us yesterday, went out to lunch, and basically they came to tell me that the tariffs have affected the pricing and they wanted to tell me in person that like, look, the price has got to go up. We tried to weather the storm and see if the tariffs would go away so that we didn't have to increase price because customers aren't going to like it or like we're not going to like it. No one likes to see the price go up, right? So basically what happened is the tariffs 25% and the Fluval 4 or the Fluval 3.0 light goes from we were able to sell it at 184.99.99. That was the lowest price we were allowed to sell it. I think next week we have to bump it to $209.99. So like right now is the time to buy one. If you're looking to get one, buy it now. Prices are going up. And until they, they did say, so they did say that they were going to, if the tariff went away, they would lower the prices again on LEDs. Like they're not looking to gouge anyone or anything like that. They're just like, we can't absorb the, like there's not enough profit margin in the item to offer a three-year warranty and have the dealer make money on it and do all these things and make 25% less money on their end. So what I do love is that they are very easy to deal with customer service, at least for us. Like if you buy it from us, we'll take care of you. They take care of us, right? Um, and I, I really laid into them hard yesterday. Like I feel kind of bad because I went Captain Insano on them about the siesta on the Fluval app and the people wanting it to go completely dark at night. And the whole time, the people that were at the table, they clearly must have had no idea the app was releasing today. Either that or they are very good at faking it. Because they were like, oh, we'll try and get you in front of the developers. Like, at some point, you can plead your case, blah, blah, blah. You know, they were really like, we'll see what we can do. And had you known that was going to launch the next day, you would just say, like, don't worry about it, guy. It's already in motion, right? Because I've been complaining about, so the app, I've been complaining to Fluval people since Interzoo last year. When they when we won that competition, we flew out to Interzoo, and I was like, look, let's make this app better. It can't cost that much more. You're Fluval. You're Fluval. You're huge. Just pay someone and get this done. Well, now they've got it done, which is super good. Uh, you know, because my thing was, we're raising the price for you guys. I'm like, you guys have to bring more value. Like, the end customer, no one wants to hear this light just got $25 more expensive, but it'll soften the blow a little bit if it's like, by the way, it also does what it did. Now it does it even better. Like I do, I do realize there's some value there. Um, and hopefully if the tariff goes away, like we get all the new features and, you know, the price goes back down. But, you know, at the moment the price is going up and it's going to suck because I feel like the four foot light going from 185 to 210 is like, oof, all right, yep, that is what that is. You know, but the three foot light feels brutal to me because it goes from like, what was it? It was like 150 to now it's 170. And you're like, wait a second, a six foot tank for two of those? Like we're looking at 340 bucks? Like, dang, that ain't, that ain't messing around. But like 150 was like 300. Somehow the 300 is like, all right, it's doable. I could see that, you know, so it definitely, it's right on that edge. And luckily they have an amazing light that's waterproof and their warranty is amazing. Like I, I continually work with Fluval, even though they're tripping and they, they make us pull our hair out because they do stand behind the product and we stand behind our product. So there's not a lot of companies that stand behind their product. Like someone was asking me in the chat earlier, am I going to test the new Phoenix light? Phoenix very much wants us to promo their lights and do a bunch of stuff with it. They offered us lots of things, right? But they refuse to change their six month warranty. And in my experience, that is not long enough for such an expensive product, you know, to only warranty it for six months is not okay. And I can't even really consider recommending uh, those lights until they do longer. Now, the only reason I'm able to recommend uh, the Phoenix Stingray light is because they essentially never go bad ever, right? 
where the track record with all the other high-end lights, they did not have a good track record. And so uh, I'm not, I'm not going to endorse anything. Basically, I've been, I told, I've been telling people, after those lights have been out for six, eight months, if no one's having any problems, I will test it. I'll give my recommendations, but I don't want people to go buy a bunch of those lights, save 20 or 30 bucks on a flu ball compared to a flu ball light, and then seven months in, it burns up on them. And then they, hey, you know, like I realized a big purchase for most people. You know, we were talking earlier about $5 membership being a struggle for people. Obviously, a $200 light is going to be a struggle as well. And it's a big, it's a big investment when it comes to the hobby. So, I really want to see the longevity on something like that before I can make a good recommendation. Because I feel like you guys trust my opinion because I'm more reserved. You know, like I know there's a lot of YouTubers that, you know, are all about a Waze brand. You guys have watched me roast them on the live stream. And I've had conversations with their internal team about what I think they need to fix about their stuff. And they fixed a couple of things. But there's more stuff they need to fix before I could ever consider endorsing them one would be the pricing two would be a few of the flaws they have that kind of stuff but i you know i maintain i'm here for you guys like if you guys are ever going to purchase from me i got to be genuine in that and if i you know like oh well they will give me three grand like hey their canister filters are amazing right like that's that's not worth it to me so that's and not not that what i have no idea if other youtubers are even getting anything i'm just saying that they're handing filters out and that kind of stuff, and uh, I personally won't promote it because I don't believe it is ready to be promoted. That's my thing. Get pricing better, fix a couple of the flaws, you will have a better cancer filter than most people for sure. All right. All right, hi Corey, long time viewer. Just a random question about yourself. Uh, but what is the most difficult fish you raised and the most rewarding fish I've raised? The most rewarding thing I ever did, I think, was raise rainbow fish eggs from Gary Lang up and gave them away. So what it was is we were at an auction and someone, a, a friend of mine, said, I'll buy them if you can raise them because it's, it, they're very, very small fry. Uh, you have to feed them APR, which is artificial protein rotifers. I had a green water tank at the time. I was hatching live baby Brian every day at the time, and they weren't. And so I was willing to raise them up, and then I could keep half the rainbow fish and then give them back to her when they were big enough to be like, oh, they can eat normal food, right? And I learned a lot in that situation because it was a real try of my patience because I was doing a ton of work for a fish that I didn't really care about. And so it was a real struggle to be like, oh, I don't want these to die. They were expensive. But at the same time, I don't really care about them because i they're not my favorite rainbow fish, right? So I learned a lot about what it actually takes to raise some of these fish when you're not actually invested. It's really easy for me to raise a fish I'm excited about. Like, I forget that, like, time and money and all these resources go into it. But when you're doing it for someone else, you're like, oh, jeez, that's just... It's too much work. I don't even know why. I'll, and I basically came away going, I'll never do that again. That was way not good. Uh, but the other question was, most difficult fish. So those were relatively difficult, but what do I really have difficulty with? For me, it's like albino blue topaz guppies. I swear that there's like not a healthy one of those in this world. Like I, every once in a while I see a couple, but I talk to a lot of readers like, yeah, they're pretty weak. And, you know, you can, like, keep the adults going long enough to get some babies going. You raise those babies up, and you just you always have this colony that's, like, on the verge of, like, you know, people are like, you've had those long time. Like, why aren't you making babies? Like, well, I am, but they're just not super sturdy and that kind of stuff. I went through two or three different breeders with those, and they were always coming in genetically weak. And then the more I kind of traveled and met other people, everyone was kind of having that experience. So that was probably the most difficult because – I'm stubborn. I really liked the way that fish looked. I thought it would sell well, but I could never get it to consistently do well for me, which meant I really never got to sell them for anyone else. So, yeah. My study is one on the use. Oh, so Jonathan, I think he's retiring back into the hornwort. Uh, my study is on the use for drinking water utility to combat cyanobacteria blooms. My question is any advice or knowledge on planet tanks for faca puffers? 
Yeah, I mean, in general, they tend to do fine with plants. Like, I've always planted them up. My employees have always planted them up. Uh, things like Valisneria are super easy. Lilies are super easy. Crips. Uh, plant, like, the back half of a tank, because they do like to burrow a little bit. And when they're eating clams up at the front, they can chop up plants. But plant the back, you know, maybe you kind of, like, how do I explain this tank? So, like, the back one-third... And maybe like you come out a little bit on the corners, I would say, like on the corner part of it, you want it so they don't feel as exposed. They kind of want to be in this giant cave. So you can make the, cave, the aquarium into a cave-like structure. So that's that's my advice. How many emerald, emerald eyes and Julie Cory cats can I put into in a tank? Okay, I got to start over. I am butchering this one. How many emerald eyes and Julie Cory cats can I put in a tank? Okay, in an uh, all-in-one tank. That's what I was, so it's an all-in-one aquarium. Okay, I got that now. With a 5-inch by 6-feet filtration area, uh, sponge filters, DIY fl flower bed filter, a lot. So if you have a 6-foot by 5-inch, you know, like filter running down that thing with sponge filters and stuff, I don't know, I feel like 300 Emerald Eyes and 200 Julie Corridoras, like a lot. Probably the pocketbook goes, ah. You'll, you'll hit diminishing returns, though. A lot of times, like at that 70 to 80 mark on those blue eyed or Emerald Eye Rasboras, you'll be like, oh, I added 30 more. It doesn't look any different. And the same thing with the Corridoras. So you'll probably hit that, you know what? 70 and 100 look the same. So 120 is probably going to look the same. I'm good. You'll probably hit that motion, I think. I, I've definitely run into that a lot. Ran into it with this aquarium, run into it with lots of aquariums. Like, more is better, more is better. Oh, more is the same. All right, I guess I'm done. Yeah. Do I ever sell floating plants? Uh, Heather, I used to. So the problem with floating plants is the top of the floating plants typically don't want to get wet. And when we ship, we've tried a million different ways, by the way. Um, when we ship... If they flop to another side, they get wet, right? So there's a little bit of water in the bag always. Nothing we can do about that. But then they get wet and they end up showing up with like little burns or yellowing on them. And we get complaints that we're selling not healthy plants or they do get way too wet and they are mushy. And so what? basically I track analytics on everything we do. And something like on that might have been a 10% chance that they don't look great when they arrive at your house, that is way too much for us. We cut products, like we stopped shipping snails at 5%. You know, if five out of 100 shipments weren't doing well, that's too high of, an, of a, a margin for error. You know, and I think when we were looking at overall packages we had to reship a couple months ago, it was something like 56 out of 8,000. Like that's the levels. We strive for obviously being perfect, and it's very difficult to be perfect because... Once we put it into USPS's hands, if they make a mistake, we have to cover that. Like So of those 56, maybe only like eight were our mistake. We put in the wrong item or something like that. We try to really limit. We really want to streamline so we only have to do work once, and you get what you wanted the first time because we realize you might have to take the day off of work to receive these plants or these snails or something like that or make accommodations. It's not good enough to just go, hey, here's your money back, or we'll reship it, and now you're going to take another day off, or make other arrangements. We try to, we honestly are just trying, how do we get it done right the first time for you? And if we can do that, if we focus on that, everything else starts falling into place. And we do a lot of, you know, we've got a lot of new packaging coming out. Uh, some of you guys will start getting, we had uh, a long time ago. Let me see if I can bring that up. Let me do a little quick little, let's go on an adventure, shall we? We'll look in the, the Wayback Machine. It's not that, there we go. Yes, we'll go back here. So we asked, what was this? You know, on the community tab, what is this? It turns out that it was packaging. So some people were right and not wrapping paper. Uh, it was basically the plastic bags to ship t-shirts and things like this, lightweight stuff. So now we were buying a lot of these, I don't have any of these bags, do I? I don't in here. We were buying a lot of these bags to put stuff into, right? Put it in, seal it up, put the label on it, ship it. And we found out we can save money 
and get them printed aquarium co-op if we buy like 14 billion at a time. So we bought 14 billion of them and now you'll get a cool looking green pack that says aquarium co-op on it and it looks extra spiffy and it, I'm, I don't know, I guess I, I, I'm proud, proud dad mode. Like <laughs> we've got our own packaging. How cool is that? Is basically what it boils down to. It makes us feel good, makes the employees feel good and uh, easy to spot too. Like, oh, there's my package. I can see it on the back of the truck type of deal. So we, you know, half that stuff is for us. We just like it. We think it looks cool. And, and I thought we could go one, one little step above. So, yeah. Uh, Zane says, I have a question. Can I put electric blue Acaro with discus? I think you're going to run into food issues is what I think. Yes, the answer is can you? Yes. In a large aquarium, will it probably work? Probably. But you might get that guy dominating most of the food. Not necessarily that he will, but, you know, discus typically are reclusive uh, feeders, and so they might not eat as well as they would. So, can I have neocardinia shrimp with my killifish? Asked Mikey Stone. Definitely. I That is a combo I have bred way too many of. You won't make many killies. You will make a lot of shrimp though still. 36 gallon stocking number. Honey Garami, Celestial Pearl Danios, Panda Coris, and Autos. Uh, I personally would do three Autos. I would do uh, like, I would probably just, if it was me personally, I would do three Autos, 12 Panda Coridoras, like 30 Celestial Pearl Danios and one Honey Garami. That's what I personally would do. So, Alyssa Bentley, new member today, thank you. Uh, how planted is too heavily planted for egg-bodied goldfish? I'm a little new to this. Mine seemed to leave the plants alone. I suppose if they can still move around, I'm fine. That would be a true statement. The egg-shaped goldfish you know, they kind of do this whole like, oh, geez, I'm moving through stuff. Like they're not, they're not, you know, they're not running a marathon. They're not sprinters. They're not good at their job of moving, of swimming. So really what you want is so that you want to pick plants that will kind of move a little bit. I'm trying to think of plants that don't move very well because I know like some really thick willow high grows, those, those stems are really thick. Like they might struggle to get through them. Really dense wisteria could do the same thing. Um... You want to make sure there's not way too many plants at the top. So when you're trying to put food in, it's getting stuck and they're kind of getting tangled in it. Um, yeah, that's, you know, kind of think of it like it's a toddler going around and you're like, oh, they're going to trip on that thing. Like that's going to be a problem. But as long as you kind of set it up where there's nice lines to go through there, they typically stay towards that. So, yeah. What's the plant in the background? Asks Fish for Thought. That is Crinum calamistratum. I uh, wish we could get more of them. We bring them in anytime we can. It's a very slow growing plant and uh, it d makes its own little like runners off of the, the bulb itself. Uh, in a video coming up, you'll see that the one we took out of the 230 gallon had like four or five babies on it, which was kind of cool. Took a while to grow those, but all that'll be coming out. And yeah, it's a more expensive plant, like 15 bucks, but nice, nice slow grower. So yeah. Best way to get rid of brown glass algae. Uh, something like autosynclus, bristlenose plecos, mag floats. I'm a big fan of mag floats with the scraper. Um, I definitely recommend those. With the scraper. Without the scraper, I could take it or leave mag float. No, that's not true. Without the scraper, I don't like mag floats. With the scraper, I love them. So if you only have the option to get a mag float, like a magnet to clean your tank, and it doesn't have that scraping blade, don't get it. It's not worth it. But if you have the blade on it, all right, it's really good. So, yeah. All right. Uh, there's an in-depth aquarium simulator on Steam for PC uh, called Biotope. I've never heard of it. it might be worth looking at too. Yeah, possibly. I, I really don't have time. I wish I did. I might look into it. I'm not saying I won't, but I also want to be like, I'll give you a full report next week. You know, I'm really strapped for time at the moment. So it'll be one of those, like, I'm really bored. Like, wait a second. Yeah. Like, the computer over there where Jimmy was still has Steam installed, so I can look at it technically. All right. Can you explain? Catherine's asking, can you please explain 
all the different pieces you need to buy to get an air stone up and running. I need a pump, an air stone, and tubing, a suction holder. Uh, yeah, so you've got most of those pieces there. So one, you have an air pump. That physically is going to make pressured air move. Then you have airline tubing. The tubing is what contains it to get it to where you want it to go. At the end, you probably have an air stone. I use the Never Clog Air Stones. they got some weight to it. You could also use a sponge filter. That would work also. Now, if you put your pump up above the aquarium, right, then water would never siphon out. If the power goes out and you have a, a hose that basically goes on your ground, you could drain your aquarium. Right now, we have air pushing its way up, so it keeps the water from ever going. But when power goes out, the water might backflow. So that's where you might want to use a check valve. So either A, you need a check valve so it only lets air go one way and not water come back another way. Or B, you need to put the air pump on top of the aquarium because water won't go way up high. It will typically just stay where it is. So do you need the suction cups to hold the tubing? Most people don't. If, you like, if you're the type of person that zip ties and manages all the cords in your computer room, Yes, you need that suction cup. If you just let it be a tangled mess of cords, you definitely don't need those little suction cups. That's, that's the best way I can explain that part. All right. Uh, can I squeeze autos with a peaceful beta and some neocardinia in a five gallon? You could, Avery, but I would probably, instead of getting like, because I would only want like one uh, auto sinkless, I'd probably do one Borneo sucker loach. So it's like a hillstream loach, a little bit smaller and, uh, could be just one. And I think you'll get, I think you'll get the, what you're looking for there and it'll work out well for you. How many pea puffers in a 10 gallon tank? Um, I, the rule I like to use is one per three gallons. So maybe you're gonna do three or four of them in there. You know, getting the ratio right, your skill level, what you're feeding, all those come into play. But a good rule of thumb to start with is basically like one per three gallons, roughly. You know, and then add to taste. What's your skill? All those things. So, uh, Jordan's got a new tank. I've got, uh, he's looking to grow medium light plants. The dimensions are 31 tall, pretty tall tank, uh, 18 inches front to back what lighting setup would I recommend um, I personally so medium light I would just go with one flu ball 3.0 so this is a 40 inch tall tank and I've got two flu ball 3.0s right so you can see here like it's really bright and so I can I can kind of play with that with the app I could show you like um, you know at so this is 40 inches at a hundred percent power let me let me do some real time. You can see I, I run a lot of flu ball lights in my fish room, and you know I like them. But the front right, which would be this light right here, if I go to like half power, let's do that real quick. Roughly half. And I'm gonna hit save. So you can see it got a little dimmer there, right? You can see more shadows, and that's why I'm running at full power. But like, it still maintains really high par at 40 inches. So at 31 inches, you're going to be almost three times as high as par. So and medium light plants, a lot of them are stem plants. So a plant that's this tall needs a lot of light. But a plant like so, okay, here's a good point. Let's say you buy a crinum from me, and it's this tall, right? So it's it's this tall in this aquarium. It needs a lot of light at that point. But if you have this crinum and it reaches to the top of the aquarium, those top leaves are getting lots and lots and lots and lots of light. So as your plants grow, they might be like, oh, they're barely growing, barely growing. Oh, growing a little faster, growing a little faster. Get towards the top. Wow, they're just growing so fast. They're laying over on the surface. But if it was me and I had that 31-inch tall tank, I would start with one Fluval 3.0 and go from there. And I'm going to set this back to normal before I forget. So that way, come on, boom, there we go. All right. Thanks for hanging out, Jody. Uh, yes, KG Tropicals will be going live next. He goes live at six o'clock. He's normally a Thursday guy. I plan to 
guide all of you right over to there when I'm done. But for now, we're still going. Uh, let's see. Is there any way to trim water sprite to make it grow taller? The Fluball 3.0, it is a foot tall now, and I want another six inches, but it's really bushy. Uh, really, trimming it is going to make it more bushy, so just let it grow. Yeah, I'm going to be playing a lot with uh, water sprite in the new... I call it the new fish room, but like the stuff I'm doing in the fish room, I want to do a lot of floating water sprites. So that's right. We do have a sale going on. See, I'm, I don't care about the money enough. And I say enough because like that should have been the first thing I talked about probably is like, by the way, we have a sale going on. You guys should buy all the stuff because that's what keeps the lights on. But we do have an overstock sale. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can newfangle my way through this one. Let's see here. Go to the website. Boom. Look at that. We've got an overstock sale. If we click up here on the top where it says click here, it'll open it up. All of these things are on sale when you use the code overstock15 till the end of Sunday night. You save 15%. And we're overstocked on these because our forecasting software says you have too much of this. And the only reason it's telling us that is because we're in the middle of summer. If we were in the middle of winter, it would be like, hey, order way more. So this is your chance to load up on some of this stuff that normally wouldn't be on sale. You know, we've got shirts. We've got like... Hoodies, that makes sense. We're overstocked in the middle of summer because it's the middle of summer, right? Um, yeah, and because this is a new item, these uh, Shrimp King is telling us that it's, you know, it's, it's saying basically like, hey, you've got too many of these. Like, well, once the data catches up, it'll be like, wait, you actually need more of these. Um, but yeah, you could save 15% on all these items. You know, a lot of rock, a lot of wood, uh, intake sponges, only two out of the three. We're not overstocked on the other one, apparently. Uh, the nano diffuser, or not the nano diffuser, but the aquario diffuser, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so go shop over there, grab yourself a light before the price goes up, and uh, we'll funnel all that money back into buying rad goldfish or something. I don't know. The or something sounds good too. But yes, I had totally forgotten to uh, mention that at all. So, but don't forget to like and subscribe and join. Uh, you know, liking actually does make a difference and being a subscriber, believe it or not, is actually an important part of the success. So you guys are going to, you know, the people that are around for a very long time, you're gonna be like, dang it, he's saying become a subscriber. But if that's the cost of doing business for me, I will continue to do that because uh, I really enjoy what we've got going on here. So if I need to keep playing that game, I will play that game. Uh, what white stringy fish poo after three rounds of the med trio? The next step, St uh, Sam Steele. Sam, if you have like when okay, let me back up here. When we use general cure, it basically cleans out a fish of parasites and that kind of stuff and give them diarrhea. It can take two or three weeks for that diarrhea to go away. So we want to make sure that we're at least two weeks out from meds to judge are we still having white stringy feces? Uh, if we are still having that, then we might want to try a different dewormer. We might want to try switching up food. Try switching foods. That could help as well. Uh, but levamisole, fenbendazole, and trying a different food, those are the things I would try if I really went through all that. I was like, dang, I'm not seeing the results I wanted here. That's where I would go. So, All right. I've got a 30-gallon black water tank that is planted with Stellatus octopus and dwarf aquarium lilies. Would pea puffers, white clouds, and coolie loaches work together? Uh, the pea puffers can be a little nippy, so the other fish cohabitate just fine. I would, I would pick one of the two, either A, that community, or B, pea puffers. I would pick between the two. When quarry catfish rub themselves on sand, is that normal? What that means is they have something that's bothering them on their body. It could be something just itchy. could mean they rubbed up against something earlier and there's not enough slime coat there. could mean your pH is too low and it's burning them a little bit. could be there's ammonia in the water it's burning them a little bit. could be an external parasite. could be they got attacked by another fish. could be any of those. A lot of the internet will tell you like, oh, a fish rubbed itself? You have ick? Do something about it. All it means is that you know, so imagine if every time, ooh, reticulated hillstream loach in my hair. Uh, imagine every time you had an itch that you, as a society, we thought it was a mosquito and we had to treat for malaria, right? Like that's kind of what's going on here with ick. It's like, well, no, there's an itch there. Like 
oh, it's because I had a thing in my shirt that was making me itch, or it's because I scraped it on a tree earlier, or because like we need to figure out what do we think's going on, and then most of the time it's like, oh, it itches itself once a day, it's nothing. Oh, it's itching itself 20 times an hour? Clearly something's pretty bothering this thing a lot, so we need to focus on that. But uh, so the original question was, is that normal? It could be. It could be totally normal. It could also not be normal. So you got to kind of watch and diagnose. Uh, addicted to Fish says, in one of your videos you said fish foods last about a month. Are there any fish foods that last longer? Yes, frozen foods and freeze-dried foods. They typically last much longer. Um, same with like rapashi powdered foods. You have to make that one. But in general, most foods, if you're exposing them to oxygen every day, uh, they're just going to degrade. So uh, packing them, storing them in a freezer, doing things like that can extend the life. Have I ever gone to the OCA extravaganza or any plans on attending? Uh, I've never been. No current plans on attending yet. Doesn't mean I won't. Now that Jimmy's got a home base in Ohio, means more likely. Uh, but I just haven't been to one yet. So, yeah. All right. John's asking, uh, timeouts for African cichlids uh, really work for overly, will they work for overly aggressive fish? If so, how long in a timeout? So we used to use kind of the timeout or putting them in jail uh, at the African cichlid store I managed. And what you're actually trying to do, it's not, you're not, okay, let me, let me explain this. When you confine the aggressor, the aggressor isn't going to, like wake up one day and be like, oh, I'm in jail. I shouldn't be aggressive anymore. It doesn't change what that fish does. What it does do though, if you can find this fish, it allows a different fish in the tank to become the dominant fish. It's going to get a lot more food. It's going to get to breed with females. It's going to get the lay of the land, right? So maybe you do that after a week and this fish that is much less aggressive, but could still be the dominant fish in the tank, is now the tank boss. When you release the aggressive fish, there's likely to be a confrontation, but if the one that was getting all the extra food and had nose to lay of land wins that, then this aggressive fish becomes a subdominant fish. And that subdominant fish usually then will tone it down because if he gets out of line, the top dog will put him back into line. So that's what we're trying to accomplish when we time out or jail a fish. You know, it's the other fish that will keep it in check. Not so much that this one goes, I should stop doing that. It's just another fish is able to kind of level up and get strong enough and get enough a nutrients in its body to hold that other one down in a place that's not nearly as uh, violent in there for you. Uh, let's see. Do I plan on expanding the size of my store? Uh, no, no, uh, no plans currently. The store, I like the small store setting. Um, yeah, it just, I know that profitability wise, it doesn't go up a whole lot more the bigger we make the store. And yeah, I guess, I guess that's the logic really is a, a bigger local store can serve locals, but can't serve uh, the entire country. Like, and we're, we're like, we were trying to expand to ship to more countries as opposed to bigger store locally. So. Tank is two degrees higher than room temp. Heater is set three degrees below room temp as a safeguard. Yeah, that seems logical to me. Yep. Uh, I know you already answered the question on this, but I watched your video and bought the med tree and was wondering a few things. Can you clarify how I personally dose? Is it safe for scaleless fish? Yes, Kate. Uh, I use it on every fish I come into contact with including scaleless fish, including puffers, clown loaches, you name it, it gets it, right? I personally put all three meds in at once. So let's pretend I was going to quarantine these guys. I would put all three meds in, one dose worth. So what that means is 800 gallons of, let's say, Maricin, be 80 packets, 80 packets of Maricin and enough ICX and enough General Cure. And I would turn the auto water chain system off and I would let that sit for one whole week. After one week, I would then do a water change and evaluate. But let's say two days in, this goldfish is covered in ick. I would then do a partial water change. I would dose only ick 
and then I would keep dosing and changing water every day until I cured the outbreak of ick. Then I would let everyone recuperate for about a week. After that week, I would then deworm them with general cure and that would get out all the internal parasites. If I didn't see any bacterial infections at that point, I would not use an antibiotic. The antibiotic is what we use when we bring fish in because nets can hurt them. Maybe they're coming in with sores from shipping or something like that or getting attacked by other fish at the fish store. But if they're already a few weeks into your system and there's no bacterial infections, it's less likely we need to use the antibiotic at that point. So that's how I would personally use the trio in a situation like that. Uh, will my med trio work on inkworms? No, uh, the best med that I've found for that is something called Dimalin, and you can buy it on eBay, and it's like two drops treats 400 billion gallons of water. It is so concentrated, it's stupid. So it's like, it literally is like one milliliter treats 500 gallons, or half a milliliter, or something like that. It's something crazy. So it's really hard to work with, especially in a smaller tank, but it really is effective against anchor worms. So there you go. Uh, is this a yes to being live streams on Thursdays now? No, it is not. Uh, I still intend to do it on Wednesdays. Uh, if I make a change, I'll let you guys know. It was, I had to meet with Fluval. Basically people were flying in and their schedule meant that I had to meet with them and we would, so the lunch was at three, but it was, you know, 30 minutes away from the studio. So if we talked for an hour or an hour and a half, it was going to make me late for the live stream. So I didn't do a live stream at all yesterday, and I said I'll try and fit one in today, so that's why we're doing it today. Uh, it is my intention to continually do them on Wednesdays unless something else changes in my schedule where it's like, oh, it's every Sunday again or whatever. Like I try to do it so <clears throat> I can make the most amount of them. That is my goal is to not miss them, which I've been missing lately. I've been very busy with the warehouse, so... Yeah. Welcome, Amanda. I'm doing well. How are you? Finally got connected. All right. So we've got about eight minutes left. Do I have anything else that I need to talk about other than the fan? Fans have been sending us cool stuff lately. Someone sent a bunch of gluten-free stuff for Robert. That was super cool. We've got – what else have we got? We got – oh, I, in the other studio – I'm gonna go. Get, I'm gonna get that because I feel bad now. I moved the studio. This thing will never see the light of day unless I show it off. So one sec. Yeah, I put this in the other studio, thinking like, oh, I like this, and people get to see it. But uh, a gentleman wrote me a well names on it so scooter wrote me a very nice letter and his whole family is into aquariums now and he handcrafted this sign for me which i think is super cool and it's meant to be hung and so i put it in the live stream backdrop you know just kind of like oh i think that's cool and i think he'll like that i actually use it so now i'm going to put it up here uh, on my desk because i don't want it to fall by the wayside but you guys have been sending a lot of cool stuff which we appreciate I am addicted to salmon jerky, which is not the exact uh, salmon jerky that the customer sent in, but it, it sent me down a spiraled path of eating salmon jerky, if you know what I mean. So we always appreciate it, and uh, it's just I think it's fun for the employees and myself. Like, oh, cool, we got a thing. All right. And we enjoy the personal letters as well. So, you know, good times. Uh, do I need to quarantine shrimp? So the answer to that, quarantine is yes. The answer is always yes, quarantine. The practicality, does Corey quarantine shrimp? No, Corey doesn't quarantine shrimp. Well, look at that. Jimmy himself has become a member. I only, he only had to move halfway across the country to finally become a member. I see how it is, Jimmy. I see. Mm -hmm. Welcome aboard, Jimmy. Hopefully it's doing well. It's later there for you. Yeah. So, uh, let's see here. My guppy recently gave birth. How long until the babies can go with the adults? Uh, usually about three or four weeks, I find. I only raise them in a colony, but if you're going to add them back in, three or four weeks. So, uh, let's see. 
Corey, I wanted to shout you out for your plants, man. The jow fern is growing plantlets and leaves like crazy, and the dwarf aquarium lily bulb is hitting the surface every day with a new leaf. It's nuts. All we can do is try. That's, you know, we, we try and set everyone up for as much success as possible, and to the detriment of over time, like every, let's say every six months that go on, we make less and less money off of plants. And it's because I find better ways to do it, but I don't charge you guys more. Like, oh, oh yeah, if we get this, then they'll ship even better. But we don't charge you guys for that because I, I feel like it's our job. You know, maybe someday if I actually perfect it, then I'm like, all right, guys, you got to kick in 50 cents. But I just kind of feel like heat packs and, and insulation and that kind of stuff, it's our duty to get them to you alive. That's our duty. And... If we find that we can't do it because the supplies get too expensive, then we'll have to change the price. But as long as there's some wiggle room there, we will do our, our dangest to do it. So, Will API Algae Fix cure my planted tank of brown string algae? Uh, probably not, Patrick. The problem is that treats the result and not the problem. So, like, how do I say that? It's kind of like dieting. If I diet, if I stop eating and I lose a bunch of weight all at once, but then I go back to the original way I ate, I'm just going to put the weight back on, right? Same thing. If you get something that nukes your algae, if you don't fix the problem, which might be nutrients or light, it's just going to come back, which is what API wants because then you'll buy more of it, right? Like they're not interested in you solving the problem. They're interested in you fixing it temporarily and then using more of their product. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of that product. So... Ooh, just want to thank you for your advice on raising my daughter's guppies. The three fry are big and strong with the parents. Good job. Anytime you're getting kids into it, like, you know, I, I talk to people that aren't into aquariums, and I'm always like, for a family, like if I had kids, aquariums would be a big part of our lives, not just because it's our business, but because there's so many teaching elements and it requires someone to get off their phone or their laptop and actually spend time together and going to the pet store is a thing, going out to lunch or dinner before or after is a thing. Like it, it puts a family together to do that a lot of times. So I'm, I'm always a big proponent of that. I like to see it. So uh, we're, we're beating down the med questions a little bit more. I buy two. Okay. I buy two dozen general quarries from a wholesaler. I dose the trio in a 20 long day one. Day three, half are dead in the AM. Next steps. Uh, so in that case, uh, I would, so let me think, dose a trio in a, so I would analyze bodies, like do they have any red patches, like does it look like anything's wrong, were they gasping, like what am I seeing here? Uh, and then I might back off the meds. So what I would do is I would, so with Corydoras specifically and a guy that is quarantined a billion Corydoras, I would only, if that was happening to me, I would back off, I would do a water change and only dose the, dose the erythromycin and stave off any bacterial infections. After a few days of that, I would then deworm them keeping a very, very close eye for any signs of fungal infections, which can be prevalent in them, or ick. Like, Corydoras in general aren't super susceptible to ick. They are susceptible to fungus, though, which ickx helps with fungus. But a very close eye, you can slow down the meds a little bit. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of Corydoras are crazy weak from wholesalers. They're not being fed. You know, when I say not being fed, it's like if I drop four pellets into a tank with 700 Corydoras... That's not feeding them like that. Yes, you, you, you check the box, food entered that tank, but it's like setting down one pizza for a stadium full of pizza. Like that didn't feed the people, right? So they can come in very uh, low in kind of vitamins and that kind of stuff and we can overwhelm their system. It's pretty easy to do that sometimes. So uh, if straight from a wholesaler is a little bit more difficult than so when you're buying from a store, they should have been feeding them well. They should have been less stock numbers. They should be more ready to take that. Um, the other thing you can run into, if you're trans-shipping fish in, all the meds they're using during shipping plus, uh, plus uh, sedatives can really become a problem as well. So 
Amanda Phillips, you may be late, but you became a member. Thank you so much. Thank you for Lady Azzy. And, oh, yes, this is a secret lab chair. Is it worth the money? Uh, the problem is I haven't set, sat in the knockoff versions of this, but I suspect if I was buying all again, no. But I am intrigued by their new mesh-backed one. Like right now I got a sweaty back because it's a summer and it's leather. It's an all right chair. It's not worth the money, but I want to guide everyone here. So first, I want to say thank you for hitting the thumbs up if you enjoyed the show. And yes, I'm getting more goldfish. It'll be cool. We'll get this water cleared up. Two, uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Everyone that became a member, thank you so much. I will try to keep putting out extra content for you guys. Uh, and then I want to send you all over to KG Tropicals, and let me line that up because I want everyone to go there because John's a good dude. We've been buddies for a very long time, and uh, I don't want to step on his toes because he's a Thursday live stream guy, and uh, it probably mean a lot to him. If we all showed up there, he'd be like, whoa, biggest live stream. Not that he doesn't get big live streams. He does. I think last week he had, you know, four or 500. Um, but let me show you right here. We're on the KD Tropical channel. That's how you spell it in case you were wondering, like, hey, how do I get there? Yeah, he's got 115,000 subs. Good. Lisa and John are good people. I've met him in person. And uh, he'll be talking about quarantine fish and why you should or shouldn't. I think based on what we've talked about today, that's a very pertinent topic to uh, transition to. So I'll probably hang out there a little bit in the chat. I don't, I don't talk too much because I don't want to derail a bunch of people talking to me instead of addressing John. But I encourage you guys to go over there if you're still working on stuff or uh, anything like that. And I will answer the last one. Can grapevine cause die off? Water parameters are good. Grapevine in general is not meant for an aquarium. It uh, typically will always rot. So grapevine wood, not a good pairing for aquariums. Fine for terrariums, but not for aquariums. So. All right, let me find my way out of this. Hopefully, I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you for becoming members. Uh, thanks for liking and subscribing. Uh, if you guys can like my videos and you share them, all that goes a very long way into uh, actually making sure that more people find what we're doing and sending all the signals to YouTube to go, hey, keep showing this stuff and don't let it go by the wayside. People are still interested in getting educated. And that's what I'm trying to do is... I try to bring education instead of bringing shock and awe. I try to bring education, and that is just a harder path to go down. So I need your guys' a little bit of help. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks to the mods. And sounds like it's dinner time to me. Six o'clock, dinner, and KG Tropicals. What more can you ask for?